We're live. Hello, chat. Hello, Roger Ver, legendary Bitcoin investor. First guy to do a lot of things. Has a lot of Bitcoin. Owns Bitcoin.com or has a ton of influence at uh, Richard Hart here. Thought leader, lull, just a crypto longevity self-help guy. Want Bitcoin to do really well. Uh, I set up a structure for this here debate. We're going to be first uh, talking about things we agree on, which is a lot. Then uh, I'll try and steel man his argument, present the best version of it I'm capable of. And then uh, if he's satisfied with it, then uh, we can go on to, you know, the disagreement stuff. So Roger, you're a libertarian. You like voluntarism? Yep. Uh, I, I prefer the word voluntarist to, to libertarian since lots of libertarians in the U.S. aren't actually libertarians anymore. But uh, I'm a voluntarist in, in the sense of uh, you know, Murray Rothbard and, and those sorts. All right. So I think we agree on fungibility, uh, the right of one person to transact in commerce with another person without a bunch of third parties getting in the way, injecting their nose where it doesn't belong, uh, you know, creating misincentives, mall incentives. Overregulation. Uh, I think we're both against those things. Yeah, I, I think uh, I think ninety percent of what we talk about. I think all of our end goals are probably almost identical, and we just see different means to achieve those goals, and we probably just disagree on the means to achieve those ends. That's that's where I'm guessing this is going to head today. All right. So, what else? We believe in uh, living in nice places, and uh, I guess promoting our beliefs. We both have strong beliefs and we go about promoting them in public so i guess we uh we're kind of advocates for the things we believe in and i used to do martial arts but nowhere near as cool as what you've done or for as long so i guess that's the extent of our easy to find agreements so i'd like to try and steel man what i believe are your arguments that i've heard uh recently above and beyond those ones that we just uh, went over would that be all right with you? Can I present yeah, what I think go, your go arguments are? Okay. Go for it. And if it's okay, I'll, I'll jump in if, if I hear a part where I, I disagree with. All right. So uh, Roger Ver was one of the first investors in uh, the Bitcoin space, one of the first evangelists. He's gotten a lot of people into this ecosystem. He's offered a lot of liquidity. Uh, I believe he still holds a lot of equity in companies in the Bitcoin space. And from what I hear, he owns a lot of Bitcoins themselves, which means that... Uh, he truly cares. He has skin in the game. And, uh, you know, he's been out there giving talks and dedicating his life to this for a very long time. And he interacts and debates with people that uh, they aren't out there promoting to the public as much as he is. They don't use Bitcoin to transact as often as he does. They don't remember what it was like when fees were so low to, is you would never ever even think about them. And, uh, you know, this system used to be a lot more decentralized. Uh, everyone ran a node because you could mine on your CPU. So you would just run the node at the same time that you were mining on your CPU. You know, there was 30 plus thousand nodes. Now I think there's under a thousand or whatever it is. It's some not large enough number to support the 50, 60 plus billion dollar market cap of this system. So what he's seen over the I'm years. Sure it's, it, it's more than. 5,000 nodes that accept okay. incoming connections and probably tens of thousands that, that don't accept incoming connections. Yeah. And then we'd have to subtract all the ones that are controlled by the same central party through AWS, which we don't know how to really discount all of those that are like centrally controlled by the same guy. It'd be like, instead of having multiple newspapers, you just have more copies of the same newspaper. It's important to have geographically redundant and game theory redundant differences in your nodes, I think. So and I just looked it up. There's 9,240 nodes that accept incoming connections. And then I, there's probably somewhere in the order of 10 times that that don't. So. I wonder how many millions of dollars of equity that is per, per node. What's a, <laughs> Quite a billion bit, yeah. divided by 9,000? Makes you wonder. So, you know, I thought that, well, I won't go into why I think more people should run nodes, but if you own Bitcoin, shouldn't you run a node? Shouldn't you want the ecosystem to work? Shouldn't you want people to be able to download the chain faster, you know, from a good, honest connection that you operate? So what Roger's seen over the years is, uh, you know, the old guys that used to develop the software, uh, they stopped. Satoshi stopped. Uh, Mati Malmi stopped. Gavin Anderson stopped. Mike Hearn stopped. And 
they kind of stopped before they stopped. Like Mike Hearn really didn't even work on the main Bitcoin. He worked on his own kind of J implementation of it. It, it was different. Um, and if you look at the commits, even Gavin, he worked a lot more on theory than he did on like figuring out writing code at some point. So now there's a whole bunch of new guys in charge. And I think from Roger's perspective, he's concerned that they don't understand the economics. They've had disagreements with Mike Hearn and Gavin Anderson, uh, unresolvable disagreements to where there was a split. You know, Gavin uh, went and did a lot of testing and said he tested up to 20 megabyte blocks and it worked fine. So it, if you're not a technician and you're not doing the research yourself, you got to decide who you're going to trust. Are you going to take the word of the guy that's been there from the beginning and spoken and worked with Satoshi, or are you going to trust these new guys? New guys that apparently don't hold enough Bitcoin, uh, don't incentivize the people enough, have a misunderstanding of economics, want to see full blocks, uh, think, tried to pump a fee market, say that fees are good, uh, which has hurt the user experience, slowed everything down. And, uh, you know, and they apparently, they appear in, in effect to kind of look like they're colluding with our, uh, with Themios and Bitcoin talk and uh, Bitcoin Reddit with uh, not letting Roger get his, his position out there that uh, so know, I, I, if I can j jump ahead. in on one part there. So I guess in regards to the censorship, I'm, I'm not upset that they're not letting me get my position out there because I have a loud voice. I have a loud platform. You know, I, I have about a hundred thousand followers on Twitter. I can get my opinion out. The people that I'm really upset with are the people that aren't me. And they're just somebody on the internet who have an opinion and their posts will li literally be deleted uh, from our Bitcoin or Bitcoin talk if they post something that's not towing the party line. So I have a loud voice. I can get my opinion out there, but everybody else isn't able to with the, with the, you know, moderation policies that are, that are going on at the moment. So, but yep. uh, overall, you've done a great job steel manning my position. So please great. feel free to continue. All right. So high fees, uh, disagreements with the original devs regarding the feasibility of things that may bring fees down, economic theory complaints regarding the desire for full blocks, uh, censorship. Let me think. I think I think I got it. I think that's it. Did I miss anything? Um, I, I think you got it pretty well. Maybe I can clarify a little bit where my my biggest fear comes in, and my, my biggest fear at this point as someone that's a holder of Bitcoin and, you know, the CEO of Bitcoin.com and someone who's poured my heart and soul into this for about seven years now, um, is that we had the formula that brought Bitcoin from zero to one, from absolutely nothing to, to this amazing ecosystem that it is today. And that formula within the last year has intentionally been changed. Uh, and that formula was letting the blocks get as big as they need to be and keeping the fees low and the transactions, you know, all of them would be confirmed in the very next block. And that brought Bitcoin from nothing to, you know, 10 plus million users. And now we have a group of people that are actively trying to change that code for success that we know for sure works because we have, you know, the entire history of Bitcoin to prove that it works. And maybe their new plan of full blocks and high fees and, and the fee market and all that, maybe it will work. Uh, and in their theories, they think it will work, but we don't have any real world data to back that up. Whereas with the, with the previous roadmap, we have years and years and years of empirical evidence showing that it does work and it worked amazingly well. And so I'm terrified changing away from something that we know works and works incredibly well in favor of something that, that might work, but then again, it might not. And there's, you know, billions and billions of dollars on the line. So that's, that's what really scares me is the veering away from something that we have lots and lots of empirical evidence for that works and works incredibly well to something that might work or, or might not work. And in theory, I think it, it's less likely to work, to be honest, but even if I give them the benefit of the doubt that the theory works, we don't have the empirical evidence to back that up at all. And I would much rather go with a system that has the empirical evidence and, you know, I don't know, nine year long track record now uh, of success than with something that doesn't have, if anything, it has a negative track record at this point. Bitcoin's been losing a huge amount of market share uh, since the blocks became full and the fees became high and the transactions became long. So that's, that's where my biggest that up, fear is. Because that is the first thing on my list because I got a little list Okay, here. perfect. So I believe that the actual use cases for Bitcoin currently are insanely small. Newegg used to accept it. They stopped. Wikipedia used to accept it. They stopped. 
There's an airline that used to accept it. They stopped. More large companies have stopped accepting Bitcoin than have started. And there's a bunch of reasons for that. I mean, even I people that- the timeline was for the ones that stopped? Uh, I think they might've tried it out for a year and then gave up on it, more or less. I think most of them stopped around the time the network started to become congested and people started having a bad user experience because you didn't know when their transactions were going to be confirmed. Well, I, I know for a fact Wikipedia stopped because they A-B tested it and got less donations because of confusion, That's which is true. reasonable. And they, and they restrict a lot of the other payment methods they could accept as one of the largest websites on the internet, um, you know, for that reason. So Bitcoin has a lot of problems. It has bad user interface. It has no retail marketing. It has uh, insane. I would disagree on the no retail okay. marketing front. So in 2012, right. I set up BitcoinStore.com, which was the first uh, website in the world to start offering big items, uh, consumer electronics items for sale for Bitcoin. We had uh, around half a million items for sale, most of which that were about the same price or even less than Amazon.com. And in our first year, we sold more than $4 million worth of merchandise. Uh, and that was back in 2012. And uh, the ecosystem is much, much, much bigger than that now. So I think there is a lot of commerce that goes on with well, Bitcoin, and it might not just be right there in front of everybody's well, face, my, if, especially if they're not using it. But I, I would disagree with the point that there's not much commerce going on. Well, my point wasn't that there wasn't commerce. It's that there wasn't marketing. So we have a tragedy of commons problem. You may have advertised for your retail website, but you weren't promoting general Bitcoin ads. These pump and dump ICOs that like have margin. History. Again, okay. so I pay for national radio ads on more than 150 radio stations across the United States for mm -hmm. like six years straight promoting Bitcoin in general. And almost all of those ads were actually promoting Bitcoin.org. Uh, and so there was a huge amount of that. And I wasn't the only one doing things like that. There, were, there was a lot of action like that. But uh, Well, I mean, either would you like to see there more? Would you like there to be more marketing? I'd like there to be more marketing for a product okay. that's that's actually useful for people. And at the moment, I'm I'm worried about the the utility of Bitcoin. Okay. I think is well, we can uh, we can skip past Bitcoin's problems if you want, and shift to the fork stuff if you want. Um, I, I don't want this to turn into a six hour long <laughs> podcast, but well, I'll give, you, uh, I'll I, give I you a list of the things I have here, and then you pick which ones you want to play with. Okay. So here's what we've got. I think that uh, most people don't use Bitcoin for the currency case as opposed to the store value case because you'd break your neck to try and find someone that it would accept it. It's very, very hard to spend and it's very, very hard to buy. So it's much better just to sit on it and watch it shoot to the moon and get rich sitting than it is to effectively pay eight times more for anything you ever used because now you don't have those coins, you spent them. Like anytime you use Bitcoin and you don't replace them, you feel really bad when you realize you spent eight times what you needed to because you didn't replace them. Right? So that's a good argument to replace the Bitcoins you're spending every time you spend them. It is, but people are lazy and sometimes they're afraid to buy in at four and eight X higher numbers because people, you know, think there'll be a reversion to the mean. So yes, people spend your Bitcoin, ask people to accept them, replace them if you do spend them. So here's my list. I think the reason Bitcoin price dropped in, it didn't drop on its own. It dropped in relation to other things that appeal to other people. Bitcoin has always appealed to libertarians and uh, free thinkers. And another meme came out with the Kumbaya world computer social justice warrior thing. And they're different vertical markets. And Bitcoin was known to these people and wasn't appealing to them. But world computer was. And now that world computer meme that the social justice warrior types love is promoting pump and dump ICO crap and is the network which all the pump and dump garbage is being released on. The reason that this space is considered frothy and overvaluated is because of those pump and dump ICOs that are running on an ecosystem which is not Bitcoin. And having lower fees in Bitcoin would not have affected that market cap ratio whatsoever. So the reason so that we I have- jump in there? Yeah. So um, it's worth pointing out that Vitalik, the creator of Ethereum, wanted to build it on top of Bitcoin and would have built it on top of Bitcoin if not for the, the current core dev team telling them, you know, get the heck out of here. You're not going to build it. We're not going to increase the block size. We're not going to make room for this sort of thing to be built on top of Bitcoin. And if that had been allowed to be built on top of Bitcoin, all of that economic activity that we see happening on Ethereum would have been happening on Bitcoin instead. And that's a direct result of Bitcoin not being allowed to scale to keep up with consumer demand. 
Now, this is the first part in the argument where we're going to have to get actually technical. You guys are going to have to be a little bit technical for this part. Roger just stated that it was an economic loss for Bitcoin that Ethereum didn't launch on it and tie its liquidity into it. And he is probably correct on that point. However, there's a technical point which makes his liquidity point not useful. And that is the Ethereum network is down often because they use a blockchain and the blockchain fills up just like ours. And it fills up faster because they have larger blocks. And so there's literally a competition to shove your transaction into the new ICO as a miner before you let actual normal retail people in so that you can get the coins before they run out. So there's already front running going on in Ethereum mining. There's already full blocks going on in Ethereum mining, and there's already millions upon millions of dollars being lost to gigantic attack surface in Ethereum. And I am glad that the poison and problems and bad design decisions that Vitalik and his crew made, which are unrepairable, I might add, multiple consensus implementations, implementations from different software languages from different teams are very much more likely to fall out of consensus than a single software implementation. It's very hard to write one thing that doesn't have bugs. It's exponentially harder to write two and more things that don't have bugs. So, so if I could jump in a, a little bit there, that's all right. So yeah, um, there, there were, I guess, two points there. So you were complaining about the miners in Ethereum colluding to get their transactions in ahead of other people so that they can do whatever. Uh, that exact same thing is happening on Bitcoin right now because the blocks are full. Uh, mining pools and wallets like BTC China uh, actively say, okay, people that are transacting with our wallet will include your transactions first in our blocks that we mine with our pool. Uh, so that exact same thing is happening on the Bitcoin network right now where people yep. are front running other people's Bitcoin transactions. You can now pay with credit cards to have your transactions included with a block because it's, it would be too expensive to pay with the fees with the Bitcoin if the initial fee wasn't high enough. Uh, in regards to the multiple implementations, yeah, definitely sucks. Uh, in regards to the multiple implementations on, on Bitcoin, I'm sorry, on Ethereum, as compared to one monolithic implementation on Bitcoin, maybe, maybe not. But if you have one bug with the monolithic implementation of Bitcoin, then the entire network comes crashing down. If you have one bug with a, you know, one of four implementations on Ethereum, then a fourth of the network comes crashing down or forks off. And But that's worse. I guess it's, that's worse. Having, having is a fourth of it forking yes. off or credit compression down worse yes, than a hundred percent of it. Yeah. It's like writing a book and then you make an edit and then you don't remember what you edited and you have to search through the whole book to see what got screwed up. But if, when you write to the, like, if, if you can't write to the book anymore and you have to wait and there's only one copy of the book, like it's, it's basically versioning, right? Like the reason that you don't write software with just word documents is because you have to keep track of changes and that's all blockchain is. It's something that keeps track of changes. So if you had a fork, like what you've described, technically a consensus failure is a fork. This thing doesn't say the same as that thing. And now an arbiter, a trusted third party, a powerful God has to decide which one is right, and which one is wrong. So I agreed, I agreed up until everything at the point where you said in a powerful arbitrator or guard, uh, God has to, has to decide. I think the, the network and the users get to decide. And we saw that with Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. There was a fork and one set of users went one way and another set went another. And there wasn't some, you know, God from on high that, that forced everybody to go in one direction. It was just- yeah, uh, These the forks happen all the time. Them. They're called orphans. An orphan is the network deciding that what you thought was going to happen isn't going to happen. And it just goes away. It's a dead end. So when you mine a block and you have the longest block, and, and everyone agrees that's the longest block, but someone else had a good proof of work at the same time, but they got there a little bit later, their accurate, useful transactions that they decided on and fees they accepted, it goes and dies. So every single day in the Bitcoin network, every orphaned block is a version of the blockchain that never got to be agreed upon because it was decided on by the God of timing and the network consensus rules. What you've described I, I is a larger disagree. version of that. Go ahead. I said, I, I don't think we disagree. I think we're, yeah. we're on the same page here. So my point is that there is always something deciding that someone's idea of the future is not going to happen. Usually it's the consensus network. But if the consensus network fails, then you fall over to social consensus, which is what you described in the F classic uh, example. And can we both agree 
that you shouldn't roll back the chain? Isn't that the whole idea here? Uh, philosophically, I think both of us are in favor of not rolling back the chain. And, and you and I think that that's kind of the whole point is not rolling back the chain and having an immutable ledger. But obviously a huge group of people have disagreed with us and they rolled back the chain and then the current version of Ethereum was, was born from that. So you and I agree on that point, but lots of others disagree and we're perfectly willing to roll back the chain. And you yeah, know, it's all fun and games. Like you roll chain back the chain for you, but when the government makes you roll back the chain, you wish you didn't have the power. You know, there's a reason Satoshi stepped back and there's a reason Gavin stepped back. And it's because having the control to make changes it's comes dangerous. with risk. Because someone, a not nice person, will put a gun to your head and say, you know what? I want to double spend this exchange transaction. and You're going to help. And that's the reason we need real distribution of parties is for censorship resistance. Because if Bitcoin doesn't have censorship resistance, what does it have? A very expensive database. That's it. We That's agree awesome. again. All right. So, all right. We believe in not rolling back the chain. We believe in privacy. We believe in security. Uh, let's go into. I'd, I'd uh, love to hear you address my my argument in regards to that we have the empirical evidence and the, you know a giant track record of what works and has worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin, versus sure. going off on this theory. What? Yep. You could well, both be right, and there's assessment. a timing problem. You're both right, and there's a timing problem. You could probably increase the blocks to two, to four, to 20. You'd have more orphans. You'd have more centralization. There'd be more power in China. Large blocks are the reason we have empty blocks, unless you know something I don't. Empty blocks come from spy mining. When you spy on other mining pools, as though you're a miner for them, but really you're your own mining network. And then you get the data a little bit faster and you start mining on the data that the pool gave you. But in actuality, uh, you're going to like release that block on your own and hope it outcompetes the one that they're working on. But it helps you to outcompete that by not including transactions in yours. So the reason that we have literal denial of service attacks in Bitcoin, literal 10 minute periods where no transactions can occur is because of centralization. And that centralization gets worse the larger the blocks get because the more profitable it is to be geographically and uh, systematically commingled. So pools have done more to destroy the distribution of uh, censorship resistance in Bitcoin than anything else. Because when you mine for a pool, you don't run a node. You are the bitch of the actual pool that runs a node and they decide what the consensus rules are. And now you have no control, no say. You don't get to choose your developers. You don't get to choose what blocks are okay with you. You don't get to choose what transactions are okay with you. You do get to choose in the sense that you can choose which pool you want to mine on. Right, but how many pools are there that you can mine on that give you a variance that actually win a block once in a while enough, you see? So like- Maybe, maybe a dozen or 20, some, somewhere in that ballpark. Not enough for $70 billion of value. Right, and so I think the best way to have, have more pools is to have more Bitcoin users with a, with a more vibrant ecosystem. And the more people that are participating in Bitcoin, the more pool operators there are going to be, the more miners there's going to be, the more everything there's going to be. And in the earliest days, you know, at one point, maybe there were, there were five pools total. And now we have, you know, 15 or 20 pools total that are, have, you know, more than 1% of the, the global hash rate. And I think uh, if the Bitcoin ecosystem as a whole is allowed to grow, we're going to see an even larger number of pools you, you uh, got it in backwards. the future. You got it backwards. The Make maximum cases. number of pools that ever existed was when everyone ran their own node and everyone okay. mined CPUs and GPUs. That was the maximum That's that fair. ever existed. And the more money and the more participants and the more value that we've had, the more centralization in China we've had. And you can't even negotiate with these guys. They're not on Twitter. They're not on Reddit. They're not interacting with me. They're not interacting with the core devs. They don't care to talk to you. They just care to run their mining software and have it auto flip from whatever chain is the most profitable. So even if you cared to negotiate with these guys, you'd also be having to negotiate with the logic of their auto flipping software, which is very risky for social consensus. Because let me tell you, the government of China decides one way, these guys are going to decide that way too or die. And do you want to risk the health of the Bitcoin network on the government of China? I don't. Uh, I'm much, much, much more concerned about the government of the United States causing trouble for people. The government of the United States has already thrown lots more people in jail for doing Bitcoin things than the government of China has. So I think our biggest fear should be from the United States government, not the Chinese government. And uh, just like the United States, there's lots and lots of people with lots of different points of view. 
Uh, China is an even bigger country with about four times as many people as the United States with a whole bunch of different viewpoints living all over the place. So I don't think it's fair to to group all those people as if they're one monolithic entity. There, there's not. There's lots of people with very different views uh, within yeah, but China. They're all, behind the same they're all behind the same firewall. And that I firewall think, introduces you know, latency. And so I, the government I think that, does have control of a, a internet network there and the power. You need a lot of power to run a lot of miners and they decide what gets power and what doesn't. And there's some really, really interesting ways in which cryptocurrencies can be used to, to tear down that great firewall of China. And the great firewall of China is this you know, giant drag on the entire world's economy and slowing the entire world's rate of economic growth. And I'm looking forward to you know, myself and a number of other Bitcoiners uh, or cryptocurrency enthusiasts uh, using our technology to literally tear down the great firewall of China and make it obsolete. So that's, uh, I'm hoping one thing that we can agree on as well would be uh, good for the world. Yeah, someone should put up satellites in the uh, sky that beam the uh, blockchain over the firewall so it doesn't have to go through their uh, their uh, control. <laughs> that would be nice. Yeah, I hear somebody makes... might have been working on something like that. Yeah, that's Jeff an Garzik, inside several years, No, Jeff Garzik, uh, several years, was working on exactly that. Myself and uh, Eric Voorhees and a number of others uh, actually contributed some money towards that. And I hear another company much more recently was uh, involved in that sort of thing as well. Yeah, it's, it's important that even if you don't like them, you give them credit. They got it done. It works great. And it's a great asset to the ecosystem. So, I mean, I'm going to call out the Blockstream guys for doing great work and not launching vaporware and not talking, but launching and having a usable thing that real people are doing real transactions on right now. The core team are did Are people using it for, for transactions? Well, not a ton because it just came out, but anyone that wants to can. There are transactions that have been done on it. You go on Twitter, it's cool. So basically, you can receive the whole blockchain over uh, the satellite, and then you can SMS your private key out, and it's only like a few kilobyte. So you can use SMS to transmit. You can use blockchain to receive. You SMS the, 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 the signed transaction out, I assume, yep. Yep. Not, not your private yep. key, hopefully. Right, so. exactly. Yeah, sorry. What, what Roger said is no accurate problem. there. So you can literally use the blockchain and Bitcoin if the internet goes down anywhere in the world, like now. That's sweet. Good. Like, that's amazing. Until they block your SMS uh, transactions, which governments yeah, but are. Then you just can encrypt that, right? And you can make it look like a, a cat picture using stenography. And they're sure. not going to block your cat pictures. So, you know, the core team, they are the best at what they do. So, I mean, I, I guess I'm going to defend the core team here. Okay. Unless you want to talk yeah, about I mean, the bad. Disagree with yeah. So your options, here's your options. We could talk about how bad the fork really is. We could talk about how good the core team is. We could talk about worshiping Satoshi and appeals to authority. We could talk about the community in RBTC. We could talk about your control over that community and becoming the next Themios, which is not very libertarian-like. We could talk about CSW and his uh, fake yeah, computer. Let, let's pick one. Let, you choose, man. One. They're all good for me, dude. <laughs> like, sure. So um, let, let's, let's use the one that's the best for the audience, I guess. I mean. Like you and I are just is getting there, smarter. Is there a room where we can see what, what people want to talk about? Or? You're never going to want to read chat, believe me. You're not going to want to read chat. <laughs> okay. It's just going to be uh, I won't open not it a good experience. Case, so. yeah. um, let, let's talk about, I, I think, you know, deifying Satoshi and Satoshi's vision and this and that. Um, it's not that Satoshi's God. It's that we have, you know, eight years of empirical evidence that his system worked and worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin. Why wouldn't we follow on the same path that we know for sure works to grow Bitcoin to become incredibly popular all over the world. Why wouldn't we continue on that same path? So I think Satoshi is a sellout. And I think that he could burn his private keys now and not risk the future economy of the world with an unknown party holding 10% of it, who may have given those keys to his kid and his kid might be the next Hitler. Or he may have gotten a mental illness and gotten wacky himself. Or he has some other socially dangerous beliefs and he decides to use the 10% net, net worth that he holds of the planet and whatever you gave him with the BCC fork and the coming B2X fork and the airdrops from Byteball and Lumens. And this guy's accruing a lot of money and he's a variable that we're unaware of that chose to get out of the game when no one else did, right? He could just burn his keys. He doesn't, he doesn't get air you're helping right now. Yeah, Lumens get airdrops. Yeah, I'm getting you rich, man. Get those. your lumens, get your Thank bite you. balls. You're welcome, bro. I think I give you a percent on the lumens. Um, so, you know, Satoshi could still be here if he was alive, 
He could still be guiding us. He could still be helping us. He could be renouncing his control of his keys, but he's not, which means he's either a bitch or he's dead. Those are the only two options I'm aware of. Now, as okay, far as so let, let's say, let's say I can see to every point that you just made there, yeah. um, which I don't necessarily do, but just for argument's sake, sure. um, that didn't answer my question at all. My, my question okay. was, we have, you know, a nine year track record of exactly what worked incredibly well to grow Bitcoin from nothing to where we are today. And that was having fast, cheap, easy to use transactions and let the blocks grow from 10 kilobytes to 20 kilobytes to 50 kilobytes, all the way on up till one megabyte. And yeah. it wasn't until we hit the one megabyte limit that the adoption rate trailed off and Bitcoin started losing market share right. to competing right. cryptocurrencies and the user experience became horrible. So we have so, the empirical evidence with a nine year track yeah. record of work well, why wouldn't we follow on that same course? Right. Why are we changing courses so, to something that may I or may address not